Uh, ATB has stepped up along with Alberta Data Partnerships, Go Auto, Nate, and the Venerable Dark Horse to fund the entire year of free lunches for all of us in Edmonton. But we're still looking for sponsors in Calgary. So if you have a soft spot in your heart for the Flames or Calgary, uh, please let us know. Uh, we'd be happy to take your money. Um, just before we keep going, I will ask who is here and is a student? Raise your hand if you're a student. Students, just one student. I know there, I think there are a couple of students, okay. I, I believe that we are simulcasting this. That's what we used to call it, uh, at the U of A. So at the U of A, they take a boardroom and I think they, they run it there. Is that, is that true, Ray? They, to the MBA students. So they don't have to ride downtown and back uh, on the subway, uh, which is a problem. So, uh, and then how many of you are decision makers who use evidence to make decisions as part of your job, not just in real life? Okay, okay, so about, I'm gonna say 20%, my quick math. And how many of you are producers of analytical results on an ongoing basis? That's your day job. Okay, all right, excellent. And how many of you here just for food? Hands up, okay. Excellent, good. All right, today is a startup themed Lunchalytics, as I said, Lunchalytics 42. And we have two speakers. We have Kirby Banman from Jobber and Dr. Damien Ijati from Trust Science. And they are going to be talking about a couple things. You can see it on there. Um, I was going to make some jokes about uh, it being the first day of legalized marijuana. But all the seats are full. I thought we would have a bunch of empty seats. But uh, those of you who are waiting at the door, there are some seats up at the front. Uh, you can join us there. And without further ado, I'm going to invite Kirby Banman to come speak to us about, what was it? Machine learning with small data sets. Take it away. Okay, the microphone should be on. These are not my slides. Those are my slides. So uh, I'm Kirby, I work at Jobber. I'm a data engineer there, and I have been, uh, been a data engineer for about a year there. Uh, most of my career has been involved in, in data analysis in some capacity, uh, and to cut straight to the chase, uh, everybody on the internet who knows how to type seems to be just turbo stoked about deep learning and, and big data. Uh, it seems like if you haven't rammed terabytes of data through a neural network, uh, with more degrees of freedom than a galaxy, you're a phony. Um, so, like people talk about turning or training on millions of images, and then your laptop can tell the difference between a lovebird and a parakeet. Or a few million games of Go and a little black laptop can outplay any human on Earth. Or a few gigabytes of audiobooks and the cloud can speak French. It's pretty crazy stuff, deep learning and big data. But I'm going to talk about the opposite uh, small data and small models. Um, so there's a whole host of problems that can be solved with data sets that only take kilobytes of space, and they don't use algorithms that make international headlines uh, like, like deep learning does. And to stick with the startup theme, small data and early stage companies, they kind of go hand in hand because, well, they haven't had time to make big data. So I will, so when I figure out how to go to the next slide, find my cursor. It does. Hey, the button that says next, it works. So how small is small data? Not billions of samples or, or millions of samples, it's more like hundreds of samples. Um, if you have hundreds of rows and you like maybe think, I can make a predictor out of this, hopefully today will be uh, useful for you. Um, also note, images are not to scale. Also, they are dogs, not data. So on the schedule, what I'll be talking about. First, data quality problems and their prerequisite that's not limited to small data, but it's important. Um, then some simple techniques for small ML. And last, I'm gonna walk us through part of a really good paper that can serve as a starting point for like what algorithm to choose and what analysis techniques when you're working with small data. So diving right in, uh, data quality issues. Like I said, this applies to data sets of any size. Um, but the nice thing is at least a small data analyst can see all their data at once and assess quality with their eyes. So uh, first, a toy problem so that we can better imagine the data quality problems. 
Uh, say we have a list of all commercial buildings in Edmonton. Turns out there are hundreds of thousands of them, um, at least as of 2014. So for each building, we know how many bathrooms it has and what year it was constructed. But only a couple hundred of the buildings inside of this list show whether or not they're wheelchair accessible. Uh, can we use that hundred strong subset of the data that knows about wheelchair accessibility to train a predictor and fill in the rest of the data set? That's our toy problem. It's totally made up. I don't know if this data exists and probably there's no correlation at all, but it's just, it's a toy. Um, I think most people would look at the number 100 and look at the number hundreds of thousands and say, something, something, p-value, no, you can't, and move on. Uh, or maybe they'd say, yes, I don't know. I didn't calculate the p-value, um, but perhaps against their better judgment, we'll throw away the p-value and see how else we can think about the problem. So the first potential problem that your data could have is maybe you don't know it. Um, it sounds stupid, but it's tempting to just start coding and swinging hammers around, uh, especially when with something that's as non-threatening as a few hundred rows. Uh, so it's just good to look in there, like is, is there bias, imbalance, are there errors, are there lions? You don't know until you look. Um, important data quality issue that's not an issue with the analyst is the data biased. So see that building data set that contains bathroom count, year constructed, and wheelchair accessible. Uh, say this, the full data set has all commercial buildings, all Canadian metro areas constructed for all time, um, but the labeled rows that you wanna use for training, say they're only from Vancouver, or for some reason the data only exists for buildings before 1968. Um, that's not good. Presumably Vancouver or 1968 had different building codes, different culture, different construction companies, who knows? So if we train a model on training data from Vancouver or before 1968, and then try and use that as a predictor for things way in the future or not in Vancouver, who knows, there could be problems. I don't really know, and it's a toy problem, so we can't know. Um, there are some other points we can talk more about uh, data bias and the consequences. <coughs> But in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to the next slide. So make note of questions if you have them on bias. Uh, as a, just a quick little survey, the term data wrangling, who is like familiar or an active practitioner, heard the word at all? Okay, good. Um, so if humans have been responsible for your data at any stage in its life, it probably has insane stuff in it. Uh, and same goes for some machines, we'll see. Uh, but looking here at this example, uh, at the top, wheelchair accessibility is recorded in French. Believe it or not, that's a real language and you might need to tolerate it in your analysis. A uh, Couple rows down, we have a building with 1,550 bathrooms. That's suspect. Built in 20,160, very suspect. But at least we figured out wheelchair accessibility by then. Um, and a few rows down, we don't have three bathrooms or nine bathrooms, we have lion bathrooms. I don't know what that means, probably I don't want to go to that bathroom, definitely don't <laughs> want to include it in your data. And below, uh, as an extra surprise, we have a building constructed in the year, no. Could be an arcane Roman numeral type system or it's probably just a bad row. You have to decide. So there's a lot more possible data issues. Uh, that's all we have time for for now. We didn't touch on actual errors in the data, like misreporting. Uh, we didn't touch on imbalance or any others. Um, but in general, just make sure, like with any data project, you're confident that whatever, whatever piece of reality you're trying to model is honestly captured by your data. So, small ML techniques, the actual meat of the discussion. Um, you've gotten to a point where you understand your data, you've profiled it, you understand its issues, and you're confident that it's good. Um, but what if it's small? So the simplest and most important thing uh, to remember is reducing or keeping your model capacity in check. Um, if your data is good and representative but still small, your biggest risk is overfitting on that data. Uh, what do I mean by that? A high capacity model, um, that Boston Dynamics robot, the one on the bottom, 
It's supposed to represent a complex model, but it's a robot. No, it slides, images, that's what we got. So a high capacity model can learn really complex distributions. Uh, you can imagine the type of distributions that underlie the difference between images of a nose or images of ears. That's a really complicated multi-dimensional space and it takes a big complex model to, to learn a kind of learn something like that. If you took a model of that complexity and tried to train a few hundred rows with two-dimensional data, it's just going to memorize the entire data set and it will overfit horribly. It'll have 100% accuracy at training time and its predictions will be essentially garbage. Um, we can talk more about model capacity. Super interesting. It varies from model type to model type. So again, cue questions in your mind if you happen to have them. Another super simple, understandable technique for dealing with small data is to reduce the aspect ratio of your data. Um, that's just a fancy way of saying reduce the number of features in the data. So <clears throat> uh, I like the term aspect ratio here. It's just a convenient way of describing like wide but short Imagine the CSV or the Excel file, or tall and skinny. So say the commercial building data set that we're working with has hundreds of building descriptors. Lots and lots of columns, not just bathroom count and age, number of renovations, number of apples eaten within, who knows, just all the features. That widens the data set. It, in, it either increases or decreases the aspect ratio. You'll have to Google to figure out which. Um, but it increases the risk of overfitting. Uh, the basic reason is it, it necessarily increases the free parameters in the model. We can talk about why, but as a, like a basic rule, pick fewer features. Find a way to pick fewer features, and you might have uh, less overfitting problems. Boop, moving on. So there's more, again. Uh, there are other general approaches that we can use. Hopefully, there's time to talk about it at the, at, at the end. Uh, but in the interest of time, we will move forward to this wonderful little paper. Um, I'm gonna walk us through part of it. It's more thorough than I'm gonna be. Um, so diving right in. When I think of HP from 2004, I think of my uncle's big plastic Windows Vista laptop whose sole purpose is taxes, banking, and serving as a sort of like museum exhibit for every Internet Explorer toolbar released in the past two decades. <laughs> but it turns out their research lab was uh, turning out insightful and practical research. And the rest of my slides are really directly drawn, whoops, from that paper called Learning from Little, uh, Comparison Classifiers Given Little Training by George Foreman and Ira Cohen. It's not that George Foreman, I just thought that was funny. So what do they talk about in this paper? Uh, they work on binary classification problems, just like the wheelchair accessibility problem. They aggregate results from hundreds of different data sets. Uh, they work in <coughs> text classification only. Their input spaces are way bigger than uh, two dimensions, like the wheelchair accessibility problem. But it's still inputs on one side and a yes or no prediction on the other. And what they do, they take those data sets, they they vary the data sets in, in size and balance and a few other ways from data sets of 30 samples, super, super small, and a few hundred samples. Uh, they look at the classification performance of various algorithms in various situations, mostly relating to data set size and balance. Um, and the way they do that, the way they make it understandable at least, is with some graphs called learning surfaces as opposed to traditional learning curves. And we're going to see what that means soon, literally right now. Uh, this is a learning curve. It measures the performance of a learning algorithm as you vary a particular parameter. Uh, in this case, there are several parameters. There's a line, a curve for each. And along the x-axis, you can see they're varying the number of features selected. So that's, again, the, the width of the data set. Way over on the left side, we have two input dimensions that, like, what did I say, age and number of bathrooms. And on the right, you might have something like a 1,000 building descriptors. Uh, it, you might notice that this exactly contradicts what I was saying earlier. That doesn't seem to go down in performance as you, uh, as you widen the data set. Um, I can explain why. 
Call me out on it later if you want. It has to do with the special IG and BNS acronyms there. Um, yeah, but in the interest of time, just have to move forward. Don't worry about what the algorithms are. They're the, the weird looking initialisms. Just notice that we can compare them when we vary a parameter like the number of features in the data set. Um, for a couple of examples, there's NBIG, top left, the green line. It might not be the best color on the projector, but you can see that with very few features, it performs the best out of all of them, and it performs the best for itself. You add a whole bunch of features, it performs worse. Compare that to one way down on the bottom, multi-IG. That one is multinomial Bayes with information gain feature selection. It likes more features, peaks out around 200 in terms of aspect ratio. This data set was 205 samples, and there are 200 features at the peak. It's an aspect ratio of about one. Okay. Next slide, learning surfaces. So this is a really similar thing, but we're working in 3D instead of 2D. Um, it's comparing three algorithms. A red one, uh, it's logistic regression with binormal feature selection, I think. Binormal separation, doesn't matter. Red, blue, and green. So rather than varying, like on the previous slide, the number of parameters that they're feeding as input, they're varying two different things. And the perspective from way over here is just crazy. It looks like it's one axis. So is my cursor real? My cursor is real. All right. Uh, so here at this coordinate, down here we'll say, number pause 20, number neg 150. What that means, this coordinate down here on the bottom plane corresponds to 20 positive examples, or they've included in the data set. 20 rows where the building has wheelchair accessibility. It's a toy problem. Obviously, they didn't know about that, but we'll just work with the toy. Uh, so yeah, 20 examples down here of buildings with wheelchair accessibility, 150 examples of buildings without. Draw a vertical line up, the vertical axis, and we run into the red thing first, didn't perform as well, and roughly the same for the blue and green algorithms. So it's cool, it's pretty, but what does that mean? Why, how can we use this? So first, it serves as a useful starting point. The paper is from 2004, so it's a little out of date. But if you happen to have a data set with very few examples of one class and a few more, but still not very many examples of the other class, you can see what sort of algorithms might perform better. It's at least a good starting point. And a bit of a, a more advanced or future-facing technique, if you, as your data set grows and you want to retrain and choose new algorithms, you can reproduce this kind of analysis and make those surfaces happen for your own data and your own algorithms and kind of get a sense of what might perform better as your data set grows in certain directions. No momento. Okay. Hopefully that's clear. If not, uh, get some questions ready. Okay. So inside of this paper, uh, they cover a lot more. Specifically, they detail the performance metrics that I didn't even mention. I just said it was a number and it goes up or down. Um, they. Uh, they explain a bit about the algorithms they, they used and how they chose them. They talked more about the feature to sample aspect ratio. Um, they talked about feature selection algorithms. That's the part that I said, don't worry, I didn't contradict myself. The feature selection algorithm, algorithms are the, the magic there. <coughs> um, and they discuss things in terms of even more involved accuracy measurements, like precision and recall and F measure. Um, but I encourage you to read the paper because, I mean, it's very good if you're not too busy swinging neural net shaped hammers at terabyte size nails, that is. So we also didn't talk about other more general techniques, not from the paper, just more advanced ways of dealing with small data sets. 
Transfer learning and data augmentation are the keywords, the buzzwords I'll throw out um, and ask questions about them if you are curious. I have no idea how I'm doing for time. I forgot to start the timer. But my next slide is Q&A. Oh, nice. <laughs> oh, man. OK, the hourglass emojis are still hourglass emojis. They're just not colorful. Yeah, so any questions? Goodbye, projector. <laughs> That is a good question. So say you had that big list, hundreds of thousands of buildings with a whole bunch of, of, of features. So it's, it's very wide. It has like number of e apples eaten and a whole bunch of irrelevant stuff. Street numbers is downtown or not. Uh, and it's very full. So what I would do is use deep learning. Um, I would pick a column that I have a lot of data on and choose to write a predictor for that column. So maybe uh, with hundreds of building descriptors, I want to predict how many apples have been eaten in this building. Uh, probably that's not the right one to choose, but it happens to be top of mind. So train up a deep learning model specifically to predict the number of apples eaten across the hundreds of thousands of rows. And then with the top layer that's outputting the like number of apples eaten regression type output, lop off that top layer and use, or maybe more, top, more layers, depends on how deep it was, use those early layers, the input layers. Presumably it learned higher level features about buildings and then train it on the smaller data set. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hopefully. Okay. I'm curious about the model selection. Are you re reducing model complexity for the uh, you're, back you don't, you're not using a terabyte size data set, you can run lots and lots of models, right? So beyond kind of graphically looking at the learning surfaces, what other what techniques would you use for selection and simplification of uh, uh, models? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really common visualization to work with in, in, in machine learning problems when you see uh, on the same curve as you train a test set performance and a train set performance. Yeah. Um, and if you happen to see your test set performance, the like evaluation thing that the training doesn't see, if you see that test set performance get kind of low while well, the train set performance goes up, usually it's the other way, it's cost, not performance. Anyways, when you see them diverge, uh, that's when you have a pretty good indication that the model is overfitting and it at least has the capacity to overfit. So what I would do, you can set it up in a 3D visualization like that and look at the whole surface, or you can just try a bunch of di different configurations. For an SVM, tell it how many support vectors, control some, uh, the, like the kernel and some of the kernel hyperparameters and just vary them to control specifically the model capacity and watch to see how close you can keep the test set performance and the train set performance. So hyperparameters, you think, just observe Yeah, and like it gets a little bit iffy because if you have a really small data set, your, your training set, or sorry, your test set and training set are both very small and if you decide, I'm going to train on 200 different configurations, I'm going to take a week, I may be able to even script it, and it'll take a day. At any rate, if you train all sorts of hyperparameter configurations on the same test yeah. train split, you're still, you have a risk of overfitting. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it gets, it gets iffy. And like cross-validation can help a little bit, but still the same risk. So that's, that's a, a much deeper challenge for small data. Okay, one more question. <coughs> so we mentioned that you would uh, pick a smaller set of features. Why? Okay. So now that approach, I would really some feature editing and some more features and press them into smaller numbers. 
period of case. You can have small data set and you really understand the data. You may want to use some um, leverage of this specific meta knowledge. But construct the features that you think could be a good thing. Yeah, I couldn't couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah, or 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 another way, I guess you can do some kind of must be Yeah, yeah, totally. That's actually related to the uh, da, 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 da. here. I mentioned that there are these those initialisms that follow the algorithms. Ig, Ig, Bns, Bns. Those are feature selection algorithms. So you take a wide data set, feed it through one of those, and it will tell you. It'll give you some some sort some ordering of your features about what might be a more informative feature for the model. So you might go from a thousand features to three features. That's an automated way of doing it, but if you have small data, probably the human intuition and feature engineering are better approaches. All right. Well, thanks very much, Kirby. Uh, before our next speaker comes up, as we're getting him set up with a microphone, uh, I wonder if there are any companies that are looking to hire over the next month in the analytics field, not customer service reps. So any, any companies looking to hire? Reese, did you want to say a few words about ATB today, given that you're a sponsor? How great it is to work there. I don't know. Thanks, Reese. And I, I didn't see Russ. Russ. Russ, you shaved. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. You want to say a few words about Go Auto? Excellent. Thanks, Russ. And Alberta Data Partnerships, I don't think we're going to be able to be here today. And we also had Nate. I didn't see Surrender or anyone from Nate. But they will be talking about their organizations later on. And lastly, is there anyone looking for a job? Looking for a job, just wave your hands. Sadly, there's no one who's hiring today. So you'll have to come back <laughs> next month. Sorry to say. Uh, I can say Dark Horse is planning to do another round of hiring in the next month for people who have a skill set from the column A, which is things like UX and graphic design, and column B, which is math, stats, computer science, machine learning. So if you kind of have something from both of those columns, keep an eye out for a dark horse job posting for a data visualization person. All right, without further ado, I will hand this off to Damien, and he's going to tell us about pragmatism versus dogma. I think very appropriate. OK. So I thought this was a good idea to talk about, but given the average age of the room, I'm seriously reconsidering my ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's forewarn people. I'll be boring. <laughs> prepare, prepare to be bored. <laughs> like. Yeah, I won't teach you any new cool technique about how to apply on a data set, whether it's big or small. I'll just try 
to warn you and make better data scientists out of you as, as human beings. Like, I've been around in this business for way too long, longer than I look like. And uh, to my previous colleague, I'll just mention, yes, I was working at Hewlett Packard around this time <laughs> <laughs> with uh, very smart other people. And uh, no, we are not only in a museum. <laughs> we, actually, we are still around. So, uh, yeah, pragmatism versus dogmatism. I know everybody knows the words, probably. I hope so. If you don't, I give you the definition. <laughs> so what's the dogma? A dogma is a point of view that puts forth as authoritative without giving background. It's something commonly accepted that everybody believes in. And you, should, you have to. Why? Because everybody does. So don't even dare asking why. It's like that. Well, if you've been uh, like me, around in this world for like the last 20 years, uh, the last two have been crazy because of the hype. Probably everybody is aware of the Gartner hype curve. You know, there's this big peak when everybody starts speaking about something and then that thing stays high on top so you can read every day in the press oh there's this wonderful company is doing amazing things with this kind of algorithms and then guess what happens it goes down because it's a fundamental law of physics what goes up <laughs> has to go down and uh, i don't know if you will agree or not with me but i think and i'm glad about it that uh, data science has slowly started to go down the hype curve. And I'm very pleased about that. Why? Because now we can start having real conversations, serious conversations about what data tells us and the other word that is super important, the science about it. And science is a really strong word. Oh shit, it's in the name of the company. <laughs> but <laughs> what I mean with science, it's as opposed with a dogma. I could have titled this, this show Science versus Dogma, but then it would have been way too religious. I prefer to call it pragmatism versus dogmatism. Why? Because the science is just a tool to get us where we want to, and it, it is all born with the data. So you have to be very pragmatic, as my previous colleague explained. It, it, it's all in there. There's no magic you can do. You can dance all around and everything you want to do with the data set. The data set will never tell you more than what it contains. You cannot invent stuff that does not exist. That's what I'm trying sometimes to, to teach youngsters when they come. Oh, yeah, let's make a generative uh, neural net and we'll uh, make new hamburgers pictures. Yeah, but <laughs> like if it has never seen what a good hamburger looks like, you will always get crap or go to McDonald's. So having said that, let's just touch with the fingers because I will not bore you to death until the point that I will explain the, the mathematical roots of most of the algorithms. But I will just mention that I have seen so much crap in the press about using AI for doing this and using AI for doing that. And it always comes down to the real question, the use case. Why is it that you want to apply this algorithm for doing something that it probably has never been designed to? The use case. Always, when you're deep in a, um, a data science problem, you have opened the data sets and you're trying many combinations, I'll just exhort you to, Take two steps back and, and, and stop a bit and think, why? What am I doing? Did I start with a simple uh, logistic regression just to see what it gives me? Because, of course, you will never show that to the guys that are paying you because they don't want to see it. But it may, maybe will help you think about the problem in a different way. 
So there's no shame. There's no stupid algorithms. <coughs> All algorithms serve a purpose, even linear regression. I love linear regression. It's generally the first thing I do. You give me a table and I try. Okay, let's try to see if, if with three variables, I can predict something decent. Okay, that's what I do. So then the question boils down, how to choose? Because there are so many. Every week you open a press article and there is a new algorithm that has been published. Well, the real truth behind that is there's a lot of makeup and um, maybe it's because I'm too old, but I don't seriously think that as you have seen, we haven't invented many new stuff on the algorithmic side in the last 15 years. All that we are using today and every fancy uh, options that we use in the libraries that we code, they have grounds in, in science that have been published for at least 15 years, if not 20. Like the, the first papers go back to 40 years almost now. And, uh, and I exhort you to read them because they are <coughs> full of truth and they, and they can enlighten you to look at problems differently. So again, yeah, just uh, as you can see, I put some very fancy slides, huh? a lot of <laughs> decorations and stuff, but <laughs> data is king. Just remember that, like data, data tells you everything. You cannot make anything up. So you can never say more than the data has told you. What you can, on, what you can only do, and it's a kind of bit disappointing in our job, it's, we can only show to others what is contained in the data. So your data gives you the truth. Second point. So of course, no data, no show. Well, but that we all understood it. Even if it's small, it can tell you many things as has been seen. But is my data trustworthy? Like there are so many techniques. But the fundamental point is, do I trust it? Because, yeah, you can measure things and you can say, hmm, now it's okay because we've did all this massaging work. And yet the fundamental question is still, okay, but have you reached a point where you trust it? And uh, last, because many of you work with probably immense data sets, I won't talk about deep, the depth of the data because data can be billions of, uh, of, of data points. If you don't have variety in your data, you, you, you're screwed. Because what you will do is you will become a parrot that has gone through the very complex step of saying a word. I mean, for a parrot, it's still an achievement. But <laughs> all he knows is to say a word. And he will keep on repeating that word forever and ever and ever in his life. He cannot make a sentence. Why? Because he's never been taught. He knows a word. Polly wants a biscuit. So it's not only about the depth of your data, it's the variety. And uh, I encourage you to read about that. There are some metrics that will measure how... Um, the, so well, well, I have now French and Italian words coming. But uh, your data must have many combinations of all the different possibilities across the degrees of freedom that it offers. If you, for instance, the example I take all the time to explain to my data scientists are, take Splunk. I hope nobody works for Splunk in the room because I'll be bad. Uh, yeah, this sell their product as a wonderful thing. We do uh, AI and we analyze logs, very voluminous logs that can contain billions of records. Yeah but these records have been generated by a machine. And machine logs are very, very repetitive. I don't know if you've ever opened one. It's like, yeah, okay, I've seen this rule probably a million times. So what they do is they do AI analyzing rows that repeat themselves just to find the one that will give a message that is not the same. That's a, one kind of exercise and there's nothing to be ashamed about it. But I will ask, was a neural net the best solution to answer this problem? And probably not. Why? Because your data doesn't have a lot of variety. Next slide. 
methodological choice. So as we have seen, there exists a ton of visualization techniques to help you decide, but still it boils down to a human making the, the balancing. Okay, I have this surface and you can even try to um, determine um, um, local minimas and maximas on the surface to help you pick the right methodology. But my message will be basic, start with simple. Again, don't be ashamed of doing linear regressions. Maybe if you have to remember one thing after my speech is this one. Simple, simple <coughs> is always better. Second point, don't use libraries. I know it's like kind of crazy in 2018. Don't use them, I don't trust them. Whenever my guys say, yeah, yeah, I downloaded this thing on GitHub and I plugged it and it works fantastic. I even, want to I even want to read the code of the methods in uh, scikit-learn. Why? Because I trust nobody. Read the code. Know how and why a model works. Don't just think, oh yeah, I plugged all the inputs to my library and it generates the outputs and I probably must be good. Yeah, yeah well, you're in for a lot of troubles if, if that's what you do because most of the stuff I found on, on GitHub's of very smart people are bugged. If you really step back, read their code, think about it, was it really the best way to do it? And I think when you wrote this, it contained, like, it exposes to breach. If data is like this, the code will crash. All these kind of things. And finally, there's this wonderful tool that I would like all of you to spend maybe two hours or three hours per week on it, Axiv. Maybe I don't say it right in an English way, but <laughs> Axiv.org is just unbelievable. I could spend hours in it. It's like YouTube. You jump from a paper to another, and, but, but it's great. Like, honestly, you must love it. If you're curious enough, you cannot be disappointed because because all the roots of what we do, of what pays our salaries and, and what fuels our passion are there. It's the grounds, again, to fight dogma. Some essential readings. Why I put them? For two reasons. One, because they are free. So you have no excuse if you haven't read them. They are just free. Download them and read. And two, because all three of them even though trying to be very practical and give you examples, will go back to theory. They will root you on why it works. Not only, yeah, trust us, it does. So, and they are free. So again, no excuse. Second, I wanted to just do a shootout and give an honorable mention for U of A, which does uh, one uh, of the most wonderful thing I've seen that many universities don't is they have this uh, SML program, which is a statistical machine learning. It is, it is shared between mathematics and, and computer science, but it's mostly mathematics. So don't subscribe to it if you don't want to do the math part, because it will be very heavy and they will bore you to death, but it's great. It's, it's really good. If you want like, to be more practical and be on the implementation side, I will encourage everybody to register for a doctorate in computer science one. But, but the SML program is something that has to live. Why? Because without it, nothing that what we use would be, would be uh, working. Like, it's like everybody says, oh yeah, these researchers in these HP labs, nobody cares about them. But what they do as concrete realizations, then some good coders come in, they read the paper and they say, hmm, I can make this work. And they do it. So, yeah, and it leads to my uh, last point. It is never always about the right algorithm or the power of the machine or the size of the hammer. It's about the data. Something I, I explain to, to our clients all the time, it's we live in a very bizarre time when algorithms 
and hardware have become total commodities. Who give a crap anymore about the algorithms that you use? They will say, okay, give me some performance metrics. Show me the result. But it's like they want to consider it as a black box. And it's the same with the machine. Nobody cares if it's on GCP or on AWS or on Azure or in-house. Everything has become a commodity. Data in, data out, performance in between. And that's the way business users look at it. We have to be the nice that protect what's in between. We have to know how it works. We have to care about the right algorithm selection. We have to care about the right hardware. Many of you youngsters believe in that cloud religion. I am the, the kind of guy who gets the bill from AWS. It costs a freaking fortune. I mean, Amazon is in the business for, for making money and they are very good at that. Like, it's expensive. So, and of course, it's very great to start something fast. But as my guys, my data scientists are, are, are growing, and I like to make them grow and make them become better data scientists, they are realizing maybe we should implement this on a Docker image on premise. Why? Because we'll save thousands. Thousands of dollars that could be invested in doing something else. So don't believe always that the cloud is the answer. FYI, just a little fact that probably not everybody is aware of, but do you know that Netflix, that big thing that everybody loves, is 100% on AWS. Imagine the bill they get. <laughs> <laughs> like, all their stuff is on AWS. So, just the final word. So, I, I, I mentioned the first one. And, uh, and, and the second point is, yeah, data, data is king. Be, be the best friend you can with your data because you can never say more than the data has already said you. Um, please frown when you meet somebody that is so enthusiastic about data science because he probably knows less than you. <laughs> if you meet like a, you know, these preachers, like it's completely on the dogma side. You are supposed to be scientists, as data scientists. So if you meet this kind of person so enthusiastic and they are generally are making many moves, you just, okay, let's talk. <laughs> because the truth is data science is a fantastic tool and it has helped us so much, but it is not the universal magic problem solver. Many other things work. And that's all I have to say. Questions? I got it. One of the world's great corporations. But, yeah, but I, uh, I just thought it was fun. <laughs> so, for instance, um, in um, when I was there, say '98 to 2002, uh, we did we implemented the very first existing version of um, of a computer algebra system, like uh, Maple or Mathematica, in a calculator. The calculator was the HP uh, 49G and GX, and we sold uh, probably 10. <laughs> <laughs> and then Texas Instrument uh, took our ID. They did a way shittier version of the code like that had like 10% of the functionalities, and they just had the ID to turn the calculator and use it as a, as a game pad, like a and they sold millions, and <laughs> we shut down the division. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it was still a great piece of software. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> oh, I have completely bored you. <laughs> Everybody's sleeping. But thank you for listening. Oh, yeah. one more, one more question. Tell us a little bit more about trust science. Oh, trust science. So trust science is a company that as its name suggests, tries to um, assess the trustworthiness of uh, individuals in, um, in many different contexts. Um, as you know, the, the easiest context 
which is the one we focused more on uh, our energy at the moment is the lending context. But there are many other contexts, for instance, is this person, so for instance, I'm Italian, you would trust me, I hope, if I cook you pasta. <laughs> but if I make you sushis, you will probably say, wait, 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 what do you know about sushis? <laughs> like, it's obvious, because trust works in context. So we focus most of our energy on the um, lending context at the moment, but there are other contexts that we are exploring, like um, HR. Should we trust this uh, future employee? Or even this existing employee, should we have trust in him? So for instance, I developed a pet uh, project model that uh, spies on the LinkedIn activity of my contacts, <laughs> and especially my employees. <laughs> so I know when somebody is job hunting, because my model tells me, hey, this guy has fight in activity. <laughs> and believe me or not, the three month horizon predictivity of the job hunting is just unbelievable. It's above 90%. <laughs> so uh, dating, dating is another context that we want to explore. Should I date this person that I just met? that I like very much, but I don't know enough about them. Um, all the, all the um, stories that you've heard, uh, like about the Cambridge Analytica stuff, I'd, I'd just like to disclose, we use only publicly available information. We don't steal anything from anyone. So, but we still uh, scan, for instance, um, databases of, um, of convict, convicted people, like felons, of uh, rapists and like, everything legally available that we can obtain on uh, knowing more about people. And uh, for instance, we, are ex we were originally designed to work in North America, so US and Canada, but we realized that there is way more potential on the, on the, on, on the other countries. Like for instance, we are expanding in Mexico and, and soon Brazil, and uh, we are talking with Philippines. So. That's what we do. And for that, of course, we use uh, data science. And um, you would be surprised, like you probably heard a lot about that, like this Zest Finance and all these guys pretending to do credit scoring with, uh, with uh, AI. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Again, go back to my slide that talk about the use case. And you will see, for instance, that the use case of scoring people in the context of lending Banks are not stupid, and there's a reason why they have used logistic regression for the most part of the last 20 years. Why? Because it works. The use case is there. So then an excited person came and said, ah, let's use AI and throw everything in it and we'll predict a better score. Yeah, they failed. <laughs> so, but SVM performed very well too. Like, there are other things to explore, but the message is just, uh, the more complex the model not, doesn't imply necessarily the best results. That's what I mean. Okay, I hope I answered the question. I probably deviated along, but yeah, <laughs> sorry. One more question. What happens if you unfortunately share the same name as a convict? <laughs> <laughs> so that's something that we call entity resolution. And uh, when we find the uh, information on uh, many different sources, we have to do the very arduous task of uh, reconciling all these different sources to the right individual. So for instance, our people are in a graph and two people can be two different vertex of this graph sharing the same name. Why? Because we cluster all the informations that we have on them. So it goes well beyond the naming. It goes uh, with the geographical location, it goes with the numbers, it goes with the previous known addresses, it goes with a ton of stuff. And once we are statistically confident that, yeah, we are talking about the right individual, and yet we can still make mistakes, we assemble the data. So if you share the name of a, of a rapist, you not necessarily will be in problems, if our algorithm works. <laughs> Otherwise, no, but, and, and you are right to say, but 
we are, we are allowing uh, an option to contest. So for instance, if you think that we have used information that did not belong to, to you, you are allowed to send us back an email and we'll double check and there's a human that will do the verification. Uh, full Make sure you were who they were, because our boys said, make sure that you were who they were, because our boys said, make sure that you were who they were, because our boys said, make sure that you were who they were, because our boys said, make sure that you were who they were, because our boys said, make sure that you were who they were, because our boys said, make sure that you were who they were, because our boys said, make sure that you were who they were, because our boys said, make sure that you were who they were, because our boys said, make sure that you were who they were, because our boys said, make sure that you were who they were, because our